I would like to um, just start out this uh, video by um, making a statement because we're going to be talking about uh, true divine signs and wonders as opposed to what the Bible calls lying signs and wonders, which I like that designation. Uh, both Jacob and I believe uh, and know that God is still doing signs and wonders and miracles in this world. I'm a missionary kid. I grew up on the missionary field and I grew up during a time where God had to do some pretty miraculous things and I could tell you a bunch of stories. But I just want you to know that we do believe that God does those things. However, on the other side of it, we don't believe that God validates the ministries of false teachers and false prophets and false uh, Christ and you know all these guys uh, by giving them true divine signs and wonders. Ergo, what are they? They are lying signs and wonders. That's what I think. We have a situation where people forget things that they've learned in Sunday school as children. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22. Lord, Lord, did we not do these miracles in your name? Jesus did not deny they did miracles, nor did he deny they did them in his name. Yeah. But he told them, depart from me, I never knew you. Fundamentally, Jesus said you would know them by their fruit. You would not know them by their gift. However, people have nullified what Jesus said based on signs and wonders, which yeah. in some cases are not even authentic, particularly in the area of healing, when they cannot be medically authenticated. Right. Something is obviously out of sync with the scripture. We often forget that the Bible says that uh, in the end times we would see false prophets doing great signs and wonders, not, not false signs and wonders, not counterfeit signs and wonders, but the Bible calls them lying signs and wonders because they are being attributed to God when they're not from God. There are signs and wonders from the paranormal, from uh, people uh, doing, trying to, you know, pull stuff on people. But, um, and, but most of the stuff that we see today in a lot of these churches, it goes under the category of lying signs and wonders. And, you know, being a missionary kid, I saw real things. And so I'm not fooled by <laughs> all the slain in the spirit stuff and all these kinds of things that go on that are parading as true signs and wonders in the church. Um, but the, the question is, why false signs and wonders teachers, why do they have so many followers? We're told by Paul that in the last days particularly, wanting to have their ears tickled, people will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. Essentially, there's a market for their product. This is a reflection of the spiritual, doctrinal, and certainly even the ethical standards in the body of Christ in the church there's a market for the product. Whenever there's a market for the product, somebody will come along and attempt to market the product. Well, this mentality of consumerism has gotten into the church, even the evangelical church. Yep. Now, it's always been around, as you rightly point out. Pharaoh's magicians counterfeited the miracles of Moses and Aaron. Paul writes of Jonas and John Brace. We're going to see an increase in this kind of activity eschatologically before the Lord comes, and it's happening. But despite the fact that the New Testament particularly warns us about it, as does the Old Testament, but particularly the New, warns us concerning it, once it begins happening, it's being ignored. Yep. It's just being discounted. People are not looking at the scriptural facts of the matter. When the Lord Jesus healed somebody normally, normally, his message was, keep it secret. That's between us. I've got you covered. Give glory to God. He didn't go say, go parade yourself in front of everyone exactly. and make a show. There were cases where he said, show yourself to the Levites according to the teaching of the Torah to go through the rituals prescribed in the Pentateuch as a testimony to them. But he never said, go out and put on a show to make yeah. fanfare of signs and wonders. Scripturally, it was always these signs follow. Exactly. Jesus never, ever, ever had a miracle crusade. Well, I've... I've often wondered, you know, about Paul and Silas, for instance. What, what would some of these modern false teachers have done if people came along and called them gods because <laughs> God was doing miracle? What did they do? They, they tore their clothes and said, this, this isn't from us. This isn't us doing this. This is God doing these miracles. Well, today, instead of tearing their clothes and saying we're not gods, 
they're propagating very often the little exactly. God's teaching. The little God's teaching. Again, Jesus never had a healing crusade, and he never had a miracle crusade. He had a repentance crusade. Amen. He never allowed signs and wonders to be the focus of his message or of his ministry. On the contrary, he warned, categorically and unambiguously, a wicked and an adulterous generation seeks a sign. Yep. You see people flocking to these arenas to see these heretical false teachers put on a show, this is a wicked and an adulterous generation, which is in no way to negate legitimate signs and wonders That's right. that are in accordance with scripture. But most of what we see today is just nonsense. Now, you mentioned the Old Testament. Um, it, it brought to mind uh, Jeremiah <laughs> trying to explain why people were following the false prophet. He, he says in uh, Jeremiah 5.31, the prophets prophesy lies. The priests rule by their own authority, which is what's happening today. And my people love it that way. They love it so. And, but the question is, what will you do in the end? You see, we all have to face God in the end. But we're answerable to him. And what are these guys going to say? Well, we already know. The Bible already says they're going to go, <laughs> unbelievably, on Judgment Day, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all this stuff in your name? And he says two very, very interesting things that we need to have in our consciousness. He says, uh, I don't know you, and away from me, you evildoers. We need to have that same kind of thing because John says when you're, it, when you're faced with this kind of stuff, false signs and wonders, false teaching, he says, run away from it. You know, you don't, if somebody's got a gun and they're going to shoot you, you run. But people just stay there and they don't run away. And that, it's, it says in another place, avoid, mark and, you know, uh, mark and uh, test them and avoid them. So it was Paul's lament that if somebody comes to deceive you, in the character of the serpent who, who beguiled Eve, you bear it beautifully. Yeah. You bear it beautifully. Yep. Instead of rejecting these money preaching televangelists, people are bearing it beautifully and thinking it's Christian to they, do so. They love it. This, however, is only one aspect of the problem. The other aspect of the problem are the hirelings pretending to be pastors who will not protect the sheep from these deceivers knowing, in some cases, that they are deceivers. Yeah, in some cases, I, I just look at that as almost being worse. The hirelings are not just um, running away now. They're actually opening the gate <laughs> and letting the wolves right into the church. That's what bothers me. Well, what about, um, what about these guys who are like selling the gifts or imparting or activating gifts in believers? I recall when the American televangelist Morris Cirillo came to Great Britain during the time of the Toronto laughing and drunken counterfeit revival, which produced no revival in Toronto or anywhere else. Mm. He said, come to the conference and for the registration fee, which was about $40, you will be assured your part in the great move of God. This is known as the sin of simony, the sin of simony. Now, they can always try to justify it somehow, saying people would bring handkerchiefs to the apostles. Well, first of all, the apostles did not market those things. Morris Sorello was selling Holy Ghost miracle cloths for 25 British pounds to take away debt. And who was buying it? Poor, uneducated, immigrant families? They always aim for the vulnerable. I always think about when, with the selling business of the Roman Catholic Church. Because same this, thing. this was the same thing that they the railed the, against the with selling indulgences. indulgences. The sale of indulgences has now become something practiced in mainstream Pentecostalism. And, you know, the Bible, um, there's no place in the Bible where gifts or offices are sold or imparted by the will of men, by the laying on of hands. In other words, it's me doing it to you. It's The Bible always uses the terms at or through the laying on of hands, which means Correct. that it's the, it's the sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, not by the will of a person trying to impart that. Exodus 30 tells us that any attempt at the transference of anointing is an abomination. Yes. And, and you mentioned simony. That comes from Simon the Sorcerer, Correct. who was, he misunderstood this thing too. 
and he went and he tried to purchase this, what he thought was a magic trick from the apostles. And they said, your heart's not right, man. <laughs> they always put a price tag on everything. They think the way the world does because they're of the world. And of course, Simon the Sorcerer, later to be known as Simon Magus, was the, one of the, the first guys who came up with Gnosticism. So this is pretty yes. dangerous stuff. When we read Eusebius, he was not a local figure. He was an internationally known figure exactly. throughout the ancient Levant. The, the, the great, great wonder of God, or whatever his name was. Well, um, moving on, um, I, I see a real correlation between what's going on in these churches with some of these movements going back in time. Of course, we talk about the latter reign and also about new thought, which also spawned a whole bunch of uh, ideas. And I'm kind of looking at that, and I was looking at it and, and working on a, uh, an article I've, I've written, because 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12 has some very interesting, a couple interesting phrases in it. It says, it says that... Uh, he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And they will believe the lie. Well, I looked this up and I found out, of course, the lie can be translated as falsehood or what is false. But in most translations, it is translated the lie. And I got to thinking, you know what? That goes back beyond just the Antichrist. It goes back to the original lie of Satan in the Garden of Eden, which is you will be like God. And then I found out, I found a definition for new thought on the web, uh, Declaration of Principles, and it says this, the concept of new thought, sometimes known as higher thought, uh, promotes the ideas that infinite intelligence or God is everywhere, spirit is the totality of real things, true human selfhood is divine, divine thought is a force for good and sickness originates in the mind and right thinking has a healing effect. Again, these are the precepts of Christian science, exactly. which is neither Christian nor scientific. <laughs> and it had a profound influence incipiently on reprobate Pentecostals who were rejected by mainstream Pentecostals two generations ago. Yeah. William Branham, E.W. Kenyon, were influenced by this yes. kind of thinking directly, yeah. where illness is an illusion, my body's lying to me. This came from Christian science and it had occult origins. It yes. did not emanate from the Word of God. Now, we need to bear in mind that the mainstream Pentecostal denominations in the 1940s and the 1950s, they rejected these things as heretical. That's right. What they traditionally rejected, what previous generations of Pentecostals rejected as heretical or even apostate, has often become mainstream today, particularly since the counterfeit revivals of Toronto and Pensacola. It shocked me because, I mean, people, if they don't, you know, if you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it. And, uh, you know, there's, there's all the, there's certain legs of this whole thing, and they've all kind of dovetailed together. Of course, there was the leg of Norma Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller on down to Joel Osteen and Rick Warren and people like that, which is, you know, one, one section of new thought. It's not a new thought. It's a very old thought. And then, of course, uh, and, and, you know, I found out that New Thought, the people like um, Schuler and Peel were very influenced by a guy by the name of Bernie Siegel, yes. who actually consulted with a spirit guide called George. So you go, well, where did New Thought come from? It's, it's got a direct demonic origin to it. Let's understand what happens. Certain things have become undeniable. It was not simply the new thought in itself, but the marriage of charismania. The theological term for charismania is neomontanism, hyper-Pentecostal extremism, right. where mysticism is counterfeiting the, the authentic work of the Holy Spirit, where Gnosticism is counterfeiting the authentic revelation of the Holy Spirit. That's one dimension, or one leg of the tripod. The second is definitely marketing, consumerism. Let's market it. Let's sell it. Right. Give the people what they want, identify the product, and give it to them. And then the, the third aspect, in addition to mysticism, and in addition to, to the marketing, 
has been psychology. Psychology fuels the other two. People become predisposed to spiritual seduction through psychological manipulation, much the same as they become predisposed to commercial manipulation by consumer psychology. Now let's look at the churches that were built on this kind of thinking. The first church that was built on this kind of consumerism was undoubtedly the Crystal Cathedral of Robert Schuller. It collapsed, 56 million in debt. Look what he said, look what he did. When the Grand Mufti of Damascus, a Muslim cleric from the Middle East, came to California, Schuller invited him to his pulpit and said, I wouldn't mind if my grandchildren became Muslims. When the Pope, a Pope who was actively engaged in the protection of pedophiles and orchestrating the Vatican's campaign to sequester public knowledge about how widespread clerical pedophilia in the Roman Church was, came to California, to Los Angeles, Mr. Schuller said, it's time for us to ask the Holy Father the way home. Well, Mr. Schuller didn't need to ask the way home. Just hand the keys over. <laughs> now the Pope is home. The Roman Catholic Church bought yes. the Crystal Cathedral for a song. But understand the Crystal Cathedral. The influences of, of a positive thinking and the new thought, Norman Vincent Peale, were there. That's the psychology. The influences of, of the marketing were there. Both Bill Hybus in Willow Creek and Rick Warren in Saddleback are, if not clones, certainly well, very much in the they groove. They said he was their mentor. Very Schuller much was in their the mentor. groove of their mentor, Robert Schuller. Now let's look what happened. The biggest church in Asia, which combined mysticism, combined oriental shamanism with this kind of commercialism, was Young Yi Chao's church in Seoul. He was convicted, not indicted, convicted for fraud along yeah. with his son. That's right. Three weeks of each other, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa, the biggest evangelical church in North America, which increasingly went in the seeker-sensitive, seeker-friendly direction. Its pastor, tragically, Bob Coy, his head rolled. What are the odds of the biggest evangelical church in the United States in North America and the biggest evangelical church in Asia, both going into this ethical, moral crisis with their ministers falling from grace within three well, weeks of each other. It was bound to happen. Uh, the Lord says, I'm going to judge them quickly. Yes. I've seen these things come and go. Jim and Tammy Baker, the PTL Club, the biggest ministry in the world at that time, the third biggest theme park in the world at the time, a Christian Disney World, mm -hmm. in addition to TV, radio, satellite TV in its early days, and a mega church. What became of the PTL Club? What became of Toronto Airport Vineyard Church? Uh -oh. What became of Lakeland? What became of Pensacola? What became of the Crystal Cathedral? Now Mark Driscoll is going down the tubes. Yep. I've seen them come and I've seen them go. Unless the Lord builds a house, it cannot stand. That is absolutely You true. can build a house on hype, masquerading as anointing. Yes. You can build a house on entertainment, masquerading as worship. You can build a house on motivational speaking, masquerading as preaching. You can build a house on those things, but you cannot make it stand. I have seen the biggest fall, and we are going to see more fall. We are going to see collapses of mega churches one after the other, unless there is a humongous repentance. But don't expect that to happen. Well, you know, when you go away from the gospel message as being the center point of your church building, uh, and get into people like C. Peter Wagner, who was one of the first uh, guys who came up with this church uh, growth scheme. I was shocked when I read one of his earliest books in 1976, where he says, we ought to see clearly that the end does justify the means. What else could justify the means? If the method I'm using accomplishes the goal I'm aiming at, it is for that reason a good method. If it's not, and you know, conversely, if it's not achieving the goal, then it's a bad method. But the problem with this is, is that 
guess what? The gospel message has some rather negative aspects to it. And so, so you're not supposed to say those things in order to build your, your church. And this is exactly why these guys have failed, because the gospel is no longer there. It's all this uh, either think positively or it's God is love and he just wants you to come forward. It's not really the gospel message. It's not talking about how the fact that we are sinners, we are apart from God, we are headed toward damnation and hell, <laughs> and we need the Savior. We need the cross. This has been just stripped out of the churches by these uh, church growth people. And you're right that that's one of the legs that has really, basically, it's funny because it's made these huge churches, but it's ruined the church. Even if they do stand, it'll not be the Lord's house. It'll be the right. whole church that stands. Yeah. The fundamental substance of the gospel is being abrogated. The biggest youth minister in the UK, Steve Chalk, if Jesus Christ died for sin as a penal substitution, substitutionary propitiation, that would make God the quintessential cosmic child abuser. He rejects the basis of the gospel. William B. Young, author of The Shack, by his own profession, he is by biblical definition a non-Christian. He does not believe that Jesus died in our place. Rob Bell denies mm -hmm. the fundamental substance of the gospel. These people no longer even believe the true teaching of Jesus in its most essential form. The gospel itself is being abandoned by these people, yet they're able to draw popular followings while they're going no place and they're going no place fast. Well, now in these end times that we're living in, the apostasy basically, um, we've got Certain people, a lot of people are turning into inclusivists or, or neo-universalists. And they're basically saying, well, you, know, you just have to go back to your cultural God, your, your supreme being, and he's the true God. And they're making this worldwide false religion, which we already know is going to happen from Revelation. And so this is another aspect that's happening. Um, let me deal with a couple more issues. Um, <laughs> We hear, I remember uh, Benny Hinn saying that he had angels in his room every day for a year. We have that clip on another video. And, and the, the thing is, I myself, I've had many experiences with angels since. In fact, nearly every night during that year of glory, mm -hmm. I would wake up and see them stand mm -hmm. by my bed. Some I saw as, as small as children. But, uh, you know, God's speaking to all these anointed people every minute of the day. Uh, but what voice are they really hearing? If there were angels in his room, they were fallen angels. I confronted him in Hawaii at one time, and I told him he was a false prophet and, and I could prove it. Well, he is a false prophet and I can prove it. He has made numerable false predictions in the name of the Lord Jesus that failed to happen. We're told that people who continue to follow a proven false prophet in Deuteronomy 18 are themselves reprobates. We're told to keep away from Benny Hinn. Yeah. We are told to avoid people who've made major time-specific prophecies in the name of the Lord. We're to treat them the same way we would treat a Jehovah's Witness who does the same thing. Charles Tazzy Russell, Nathan Noor, and, and, and Rutherford, the founders of Jehovah's Witnesses, were proven false prophets. I can prove Mike Bickle is a proven false prophet. I can prove by biblical definition Rick Joyner is a proven false prophet. That's right. I can prove that Bill Johnson and Che An are proven false prophets. I can prove that these men have made major predictions in the name of the Lord that failed to happen. Just think of it, Sandy. Well, this Just think of it. See Peter Wagner, who you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Che An. Yep. Rick Joyner and Bill Johnson on television with Wendy and Rory, Rory Alec prophesying over Todd Bentley. Right. Prophesying over him how he's going to lead the great revival. Wendy and Rory Alec saying, if you speak against this, if you speak against Todd Bentley, you're of Satan. The whole time they were prophesying over him, he was immorally engaged with another woman he was not married to. After they prophesy over him, 72 hours later, approximately 72 hours later, Todd Bentley abandons his wife, a handicapped Christian woman, and his three children. He leaves his wife 
and his children yeah. and takes off with this other woman. Yeah. Divorces his biblical wife, marries this other woman he was committing adultery with, and now she's prophesying with him with yes. the blessings of Rick Joyner. So a couple of nights ago, I had a dream where Oral Roberts was speaking to Todd. They were, I, I didn't understand what they're saying, but I remember they were talking. And then he looked over and he saw me and he stopped and he ran over to me and he put his hands over my eyes and he said, what do you see? And so I looked and I didn't see anything at first and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eye. And Oral Roberts said, he put his, his hands over my eyes and said, what do you see? And I said, I didn't see anything at first, and then all of a sudden I saw this elephant racing across my eyes, and it was, it was dancing, it was going crazy, it was just, it had this big smile, and it was just, just going crazy, and I said, it's a, a wild elephant, I see a wild elephant, and then I said, what's, what's with the elephant? He said, exactly, what is it with the elephant? And then I looked again, and in, in that vision, what was highlighted was the trunk of the elephant. I said, it's the elephant nose, and he said, yes. I said, it's discernment. And he said, exactly. And then he says, do you see the lion? And I closed my eyes again, and then I saw the lion. And the lion, it was just a golden lion, and I woke up. And um, when I woke up, literally, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I just felt like the Lord was highlighting things to me about the dream. And in the dream, I thought it was pretty ironic that Oral Roberts put his hands he covered my eyes and said what do you see and I thought that was interesting because he's covering my eyes what do you see and I felt like the Lord was saying that that even more so now for the church today we need to walk by faith and not by sight what do you see you know I didn't see anything at first until I really looked and I pressed in you know and I saw the wild elephant and so when the elephant came running in and I said what is it with it so it's almost like what's with walking by faith how do you walk by faith and not by sight by discerning the times and the seasons just like the sons of Ishkar discerning that's what gives you hope when you're walking through a hard time and you're you know walk by faith when everything around you looks dark and dim is discerning the times and season by getting a hope from God um, whew, getting <laughs> Getting a hope from God <laughs> to be able to see, to discern the times and the seasons that's ahead of you. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant, it was a wild elephant, a wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. <laughs> Rick Joyner, you are a false prophet. You are somebody who sanctions iniquity. And you will give account before the judgment seat of Christ unless you repent. And if you do repent, you will get out of the ministry where you haven't repented. And bring Cheyenne and bring Bill Johnson with you. Well, you know, so much of this what's called modern prophecy is really not prophecy, a biblical prophecy at all. It's basically uh, telling people's fortunes kind of. It's you know. clairvoyance. It's clairvoyance. I like what Jeremiah said uh, in categorizing these people who think that they're hearing from God. He says, the Lord said to me, this is uh, Jeremiah 14, 14. Then the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them or appointed them or spoken to them. But he says four things. I like this. They are, number one, prophesying to you false visions. They're uh, divinations, which is omens basically, idolatries, and the delusions of their mind. I like the way he categorizes those four things because I see all four of those things. These people are saying, oh, God took me on a trip to hell, you know. This guy that died over there in, uh, in um, Nigeria supposedly and got brought back to life, he, he took a trip to hell. God took him on a trip to hell. And uh, he came back and he said there was a sign Oh, uh, at the gate of hell saying, welcome to hell. Well, Mike Oppenheimer and I were watching the tape. We stopped the tape and said, wait, wait a second. God wouldn't put that sign there. Satan's not there. And so who put up this sign? So you already know it's a false vision. And I've looked at all of these <laughs> trips, things, and I've got uh, book reviews on my site. They're all false because they do not square up with the, with the Bible. Two things that strikes me from the book of Jeremiah concerning false prophets. In Hebrew, his name is Yermiyahu Hanavi. And <coughs> he keeps coming back to two things that he highlights in chapter 23 and in chapter 10. 
In chapter 10, he uses the Hebrew term abil. We translate it usually, my people are stupid. Now, it doesn't mean congenitally stupid or born with naturally low intelligence. Abil, I suppose I would translate, I speak Hebrew, is they pervert their logic yeah. in order to justify something which cannot rationally be That's defended. correct. Yep. They are abil. They pervert their logic. Yeah. My people are stupid. Well, but Jeremiah 23 said, yeah. does not focus on the problem with the false prophet. <coughs> prophets. It begins with, oi bavoi l'roim. Oi l'roim. Woe to the pastors. Woe mm. to the shepherds. The real so problem true. is not the false prophets. It's the so-called pastors who will not protect the Lord's sheep yeah, from they them. They let them in. Yeah, and I had a guy come up to me in, in one of my, used to be a supporting church, and uh, they had started down this whole New Apostolic Road, and after the church service, he comes up to me, he says, I want to lay hands on you, and I wouldn't let him do it. He says, well, I'm going to prophesy to you anyway. I prophesy the Lord told me that you're going to raise the dead in Micronesia. And I thought about it for a minute, and I realized that's a false prophecy. Why would God be telling me something in advance like that to puff up my pride? That's what a false pro yes. prophecy does. They're always puffing people up. I'm going to lay hands on you, and you'll become an apostle. They've done this over there in China. Or you're going to become a prophet. And the person goes out on this long goose chase from which he may never return because he thinks it's from God. Notice and, in Scripture, yeah. when God raised up a prophet in either testament, either in the book of Acts or in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, it's either because things were wrong or because things were in serious danger of going wrong. That's right. If things were not wrong, if everything was hunky-dory, the people wouldn't need a prophet. The word of God would have been good enough. God only raised up prophets when they were in trouble or when they were heading for trouble. That's right. Yep. Well, I also, you know, you were talking about... Um, you know, he, he says they prophesy you false visions. They also prophesy divinations. You know, I, I've seen these guys. They use omens all the time now. You know, uh, I was driving down the road and, and a bird pooped on my windshield. And, and, and God was telling me that, that, that the Satan's pooping on your church, you know. I mean, what kind of a vision is that? What kind of a... It's divination. You know, it's like reading a tea leaf or throwing out bones. We don't do that as Christians, you know. And... Of course, idolatries, I mean, these guys are idolizing all kinds of stuff. These Especially days. mammon. Especially mammon and, and the false teachers. You know, false prophets are out to make a prophet. Right. False prophets are out for profit. Yeah. That's the name of the game. You will find scripturally, if there is a true prophet, one, they will not identify themselves as such. Amos said, I'm not the prophet or the son of a prophet. Nobody in their right mind would want that job. Nobody would want the job of a prophet. You'd have to be out of your mind to want that job. That's right. If somebody is a true prophet, they don't have to say they're a prophet. The Holy Spirit is going to show the faithful believers that that's a prophet. Absolutely. They don't have to say it. That's to begin with. Yeah. When you see somebody going around saying they're a prophet, it's because they're trying to make a prophet. That's right. Yep. I, I've seen that so often. And, of course, you know, he ends with, uh, they also speak from the delusions of their minds. And to me, I, that's one I see often, you know. Um, we've, got, we've got video of this, a couple of these ladies who are doing this prophecy stuff. And, man, they are, it's scary to watch them. You know, the one moves her head back and forth a thousand times a second. And it's, it's scary Stacey to watch. Campbell. Yeah, absolutely Stacey Campbell. Frightening. Cindy Jacobs, absolutely yeah. frightening. Y el poder del Espíritu Santo vendrá. Fuego. Jesus. Jesus. Oh, more, Mas. more, Mas. <laughs> We can go back 50 to 100 years. What J.C. Ryle predicted concerning the Church of England happened. Absolutely. Bearing in mind, it would have been unthinkable at the time he prophesied it, said it was going to It did. You can go back to the 1940s and 50s. What A.W. Tozer said was going to happen to mainstream evangelicalism. He, was absolutely, he right. was absolutely right. You can go back as recently to the 1970s. 
Francis Schaeffer Francis warned Schaefer, what was one. going to happen to mainstream Pentecostalism. And, and I would put Dave Hunt in that group. I'd put I, Dave Hunt in that group. You know, he wrote Seduction of Christianity and nobody believed him. Oh, the New Age is going to come into the church? No Absolutely. way that's going to happen. Absolutely. I don't deny this <laughs> but But they get it right. They get it right. That's, that's the difference. Um, all right. Uh, it, uh, uh, let's change over to, uh, not change, but go over to uh, Bethel Church, where this guy's teaching all kinds of weird stuff. And one of the things that Benny Johnson, who is, uh, I think it's his uh, daughter or wife, it's his wife, she says that people are getting saved not by preaching in the gospel, but by angels ringing bells in the church. <laughs> the New Testament says... Faith cometh by hearing, Amen. and hearing the word of God. Which do we believe? Her mystical nonsense or the word of God? You cannot believe both. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing the word of God. The only adjustment you can make in this is that there were not massive copies of the scriptures around in the first century, so the scriptures were read and people would hear it. I would say today people can get saved by reading yes, what was read. Sure. But that's it. That's the only scriptural basis. It comes from reading, from hearing the word of God. It does not come from angels ringing bells. Well, and the only reference that I could come up with that she must have gotten this idea from, but she's totally opposite of it, is when angels rejoice when someone repents. In Luke 15, 10, it says, uh, uh, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. But how is a sinner going to know they have to repent unless they hear the gospel message? That's absolutely correct. We see this, that the prophets will prophesy nonsense, it says again in Jeremiah 23. What the straw have in common with grain, but let him who has my word. If somebody is not doctrinally solid, if someone is not coming from a biblically solid doctrinal perspective, they're not a prophet. God would never trust prophetic revelation with somebody who was not grounded in biblical doctrine, yeah. rightly dividing the word of God. Never. In fact, the function of a prophet is to point people back to the word of God. These false prophets don't even believe it to begin with. I, I just really don't like a lot of what goes on in these churches these days. And it's, some of it is kind of old Pentecostal tricks from long ago. But, you know, all this gold dust and God changing people's teeth into gold fillings and angel footprints and angel feathers falling down in the Again, church. Again, this, <laughs> this is the Amy Semple McPherson, A.A. Yeah. A. Allen. That's true, yeah. Lunacy that mainstream Pentecostal churches and denominations rejected as false. Two generations ago. That's right. Yep. And it's, but, you know, they keep using it, and, the, and people who don't know their history uh, tend to believe it and get fooled by it. Well, I guess this Benny Johnson actually identified the name of this angel as um, uh, 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 Channel, <laughs> which sounds to me very much like some New Age thing because they're totally into channeling. And I think that's what's going on in a lot of these churches. Now, you know, we had, we had Branham, who had an angel that he basically channeled. And same thing with Todd Bentley. They couldn't heal anybody unless their angel was present. These things are known as avot in Hebrew, familiar spirits. Mm. There's another consideration. When someone like Rick Joyner makes the claim that he was taken up to heaven and saw certain things, as did the homosexual um, Robert Slyardin, <laughs> what these people actually are, yeah. it's not what Paul was in 2 no. Corinthians chapter 2. What these people actually are, are New Age ascended masters masquerading as Christian prophets yeah. or claiming to be Christian prophets. But all they are is New Age ascended masters. Either they're complete charlatans and they're lying, or else they've had some kind of astral projection or occult experience. Those are the only two possibilities because what they say and what they do does not agree with Scripture. You know, I'm glad you're saying this because this was really the position quite a long time ago, like back in Kurt Koch's day, you know, when he observed people like Branham and, yes. and also Catherine Kuhlman. He said that they were spiritists. 
And I think he really had it right. And we've gotten away from that understanding. Yeah. You know, we, under, we know that we need to test, the, test yeah. the spirits because the false prophets have gone out. So there are spirits behind those false prophets. If people don't know, Kurt Koch, whom Sandy mentioned, was an evangelical Christian, a born-again Christian psychiatrist who first investigated mysticism, a lot of occult infiltrating stuff, infiltrating the church from the perspective of both a psychiatrist and a theologian. Quite a character, quite a man of God in his day. Yes, and uh, I'm really thankful for his investigation, Absolutely. especially of Branham, because we don't have a lot of records on that. And Branham went to India, for instance. He catalogued Branham went to India on a crusade. He, he got to know this uh, Indian guy, and he called this Indian guy the son of God. So we got some problems there. Well, what about um, this glory cloud that supposedly is appearing at Bethel? Uh, you know, what would happen if the real Shekinah glory came down? Like children, you know, just discovering him. You know, we don't seek for signs, but we don't ignore them either. <laughs> Probably what happened in the days of Moses when 3,000 fell in one day. Again, what you see happening at Bethel is mysticism. That's all it is, is a demonic delusion. The doctrines of Mr. Johnson are simply not only unscriptural, they are contra-scriptural. And little different than no better are what you see in Kansas City with Mike Bickle. You know, I just, I think about Moses who wanted to see God, and God said, you can't see me. Uh, and, you know, he could see the tail end of God as he was leaving because he says, you cannot see my face for no one who, you, no one may see me and live. And I always get cracked up when these guys say, well, God showed up or God came into my bedroom or Jesus Christ came into my bedroom in a fireman's hat like he did for Yong Gi Cho. I'm going, you know, when John saw <laughs> Jesus, he fell down like, as if dead. I mean, we're talking about a being that is far beyond our ability to even see. So these guys are not seeing God or Jesus. John saw Jesus in his deity. That's right. But John had known Jesus in his humanity. That's true. He actually knew him personally as a human. When he saw him in his deity, he fell as if slain. This is un unbelievable. It's, be it's beyond belief the claims these people are making. It yeah. relates in strong measure, particularly from the angelic aspect, to what we're warned about in Colossians 2, yeah. taking their stand on a vision of angels. Yeah. Mormonism was founded that way. Islam was founded that way. Many of the doctrines of Roman religion. Catholicism were found that way, yeah. but nothing in the New Testament was founded that way. All right, what a, moving on to one of Bill Johnson's uh, current teachings. Actually, I think he's been teaching it for a while, but... He teaches on uh, what's called kenosis, which is the relinquishment of divine attributes of Jesus Christ in becoming human. And I see this in the Word of Faith movement. This is another new thought connected thing because you want to get people to the point where they can also be divine just as Jesus yeah. is divine. But Jesus was not divine for a while. And then when, when, when he was baptized and the Holy Spirit came down, and he became uh, an anointed man, so you and I can be an anoint, anointed people and do exactly what Jesus did. Scriptural kenosis comes from Philippians chapter 2, where it essentially says, although he was God, right. he understood that we could not comprehend his equality with God in any way that we could possibly grasp it. He came in the form of a servant. That's the kenosis. Jesus was God, he remained God, but to accommodate us, he became man, fully human and fully divine, right. but never once used his divine power. That's right. What he did, he did in concert with his Father by the power of the Spirit. <laughs> that is the only thing that the New Testament means, Yes. if you're going to employ the theological term by kenosis. It has nothing whatsoever to do with what's being merchandised. Yeah, it's, it's a total false idea, and yes. it's actually very much, it's very new age, it's very new thought, because... Behind all this word of faith stuff, behind all that, you have to get to the point where you become a little God. And, you know, I've got Benny Hinn on tape getting the whole crowd to say, I chant, I am, I am. God came from heaven, became a man, made man 
into little gods, went back to heaven as a man. He faces the Father as a man. I face devils as the Son of God. You see what I'm talking about? You say, Benny Hinn, am I a little God? You're a son of God, aren't you? You're a child of God, aren't you? You're a daughter of God, aren't you? What, what else are you? Quit your nonsense. What else are you? If you say, I am, you're saying, I'm a part of him, right? Is he God? Are you his offspring? Are you his children? You can't be human. I have news for you. When you were born again, the Word was made flesh in you. And you became flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. Don't tell me you have Jesus. You are everything he was and everything he is and ever shall be. And the new man doesn't look back. It has no past. It doesn't look ahead. It got no future. It says, I am as he is. That's what it says. As he is, so are we in this world. Jesus said, go in my name, go in my stead. Don't say I have, say I am, I am, I am, I am, I am. That's why you're never, uh, ever, ever, ought to say I'm sick. How can you be sick if you're the new creation? And I was thinking to myself, you know, if he'd done that in Israel, uh-oh. <laughs> they, they know what it means to chant I am. <laughs> One of the big problems is definition and ignorance of what the terms mean. Whenever you're dealing with any form of Gnosticism, of mystical subjective revelation, they will use the same terms the scripture does, but mean something different by it. For instance, when I go to your state, to Maui, New Ages flock to the beach, you tell them the gospel, and they'll tell you, I saw the light. Well, you say, I saw the light. Well, they saw the light, the cosmic illumination of the inner self. You tell them you were born again. Well, they were born again. Right. They're reincarnated. Redefine you tell the them terms. you believe in sin. Well, they believe in sin. That's giving place to negative vibes or negative energy. That's what they mean. They will use the same terms. Yes. You see this in Roman Catholicism. Yeah. A Roman Catholic theologian would say we're saved by grace, except grace is an ethereal substance earned by the sacraments. They have a different Dispensed definition by Mary. of grace. It's yeah. simply different. They will use the same terms but means something entirely that's a different by those terms. That's a complete cult technique, the whole thing. A complete cult technique. Mormons do it, Jehovah's Witnesses do it, the Church of Rome does it, uh, Kabbalistic Judaism does it. Yeah. Now we have supposedly born again evangelical Pentecostals doing it. Yeah, it's, it's bad. And I see so many of these cultic techniques being used today. You know, we talked about diaprax on the former tape as well, you know, Diaprax, uh, yes. the Hegelian dialectic mixed with praxis, <laughs> which is not <coughs> biblical exposition. It's a way to get people over to your, your opinion and get them to change their worldview, which, by the way, is, one of, is the biggest aim, I believe, of Satan. Uh, this whole, all the slain of the spirit, all the monkey business is just a softening you up to get your belief system changed, because if he can change you to believe in a different spirit, in a different gospel, in a, in a different Jesus, his job is done. You know, this diapraxis is the invisible thread that runs through the purpose-driven agenda yeah. of Rick Warren. It, it actually is diapraxis. Yeah. He has to use the message, something that is not, not a paraphrase, an abortion, something that is not what the Word of God actually says or means in the original languages, but he misrepresents it as if that's what right. the Word of God teaches in order to change your fundamental way of thinking about what the Word of God actually does that's say. That's right. And of course he packages it cleverly as a marketing technique. It's simply diapraxis. And then, and then you know, they, they followed up with praxis, which is basically, let's all get together and discuss. Let's have a, a conversation about this. And we'll call, come to consensus on this issue. That was but what they're McLaren. trying... That was Brian McLaren. Exactly. That's his exact technique. That's, that's what so he what, does. what was the consensus with Brian McLaren? He performed the same sex wedding for his son and his son's husband by consensus. Oh, gosh. Well, um... <clears throat> One more thing is on Johnson. Uh, in, in a 2006 book titled Dreaming with God, Johnson writes, when referring to a practice associated with the new age, he says this, many prominent pastors and conference speakers add fuel to the fire of fear by assuming that because the new age promotes it, its origins must be from the devil. I find that uh, form of reasoning weak at best. 
If we follow the line of thought, we w- if we follow that line of thought, we will continue to give the devil the tools that God has given us for success in life and ministry. What does Paul say in 1 <laughs> Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6? That you may learn not to exceed the things which mm-hmm. are written. One of the repeated claims of these kind of people that I've been hearing since the counterfeit revival from Toronto, which was a failed fiasco, and it's Pensacola clone, was this. All truth is God's truth. Yeah. Um, well, that may be true, but you cannot base a doctrine on a truth not recorded in Scripture. That's right. We cannot exceed the things which are written. Yep. Once you begin to take something and make it a doctrinal premise not found in the Word of God, you're violating the Word That's of God. That's right. And the Word of God, I, I love this from Psalm 119.89, your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Yes. It stands firm in the heavens. That little Bible you have is eternal. It doesn't go away. Those are the words of God. They're eternal words. Some of these people have become so arrogant yes. and deceived themselves as to say God is bigger than his word. I've actually heard of some of them saying this. Well, first of all, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Jesus is the Word yep. made flesh. Yep. How can God be bigger than God? <laughs> Not only that, we are told in the scriptures, God magnifies His Word above His name. He magnifies His Word above the essence of His own being, because it is His own being. All right, well, Bill Johnson basically claims that we have the same authority that Jesus does. Is that Is that true? Do we have the same authority? Can we do the same miracles that Jesus did? If that was the case, the apostles would have been able to cast out the demons that only Jesus could. Right. That is not the case. Now, Jesus did say, greater works than these will you do. But what did he mean by it? Jesus only had about 500 committed followers. About 500 we know of. From the day of Pentecost, Peter and the apostles had 3,000. Um, greater in some numerical sense, yes. But greater in the, in, in the sense of the essence of the deeds themselves, no. no. Well, you know, where, where are people walking on water? Where are they feeding 5,000 with, you know, a couple of loaves and fishes? Although I've heard that Bill Johnson uh, claims that uh, they fed them, what was it, steak or prime rib or something? And, and it just kept uh, uh, replenishing itself. It's, those stories are fun. We've had, the, we've had, we had prime rib multiply when we were feeding the homeless and poor ones. I, you know, you multiply bread all you want, that's cool, but prime rib, think about it. We're, we're talking about a substantial miracle here. I don't believe this story, by the way. No, but, I don't either. Not only, you know, it, it was not only that, but we're told in Romans, the Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. Right. If we have the same power and authority as Jesus, we could trample Satan under our own feet. That's right. <laughs> that's right. But, and, but, it's, but that's what they're teaching because they're teaching new thought. They're teaching that we can do that. I can legislate from the heavenlies. That's what C. Peter Wagner says. I mean, it's absolutely uh, ridiculous according to the scripture. Um, we have to understand C. Peter Wagner claimed to be a follower of Donald McGavern, which he wasn't. He was the theocratic successor of McGavern, but not a follower. Yeah. McGavern never taught what C. Peter Wagner does. Never. C. Peter Wagner had this idea that you can go see where there's a move of God happening in the world of revival and copy what they do and make the revival right. happen it's a pragmatic. using the same, right, pragmatically using the same template. Right. Well, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't take into account the sovereignty of God's grace to move at a particular time in a particular place. Absolutely. Additionally, if you go into South America, it's a growth where it's people leaving Roman Catholicism right. in significant numbers, usually into Pentecostalism or some other form of evangelicism. It's ex-Catholics who are becoming right. born again. Wagner is not even copying that model. He's accepting Roman Catholicism and the ecumenical movement. He's not even doing what he claims to do. Yeah. Well, he's the head apostle. He said he's the same thing as James is to this generation. And um, 
I've got a whole teaching on this, and this is coming out in this new book. It's not in any of my books yet, but it's coming out in this new book, Apostles and Prophets, The Foundation of the Church. And um, I, I identify with James in terms of my function as an apostle, as a horizontal apostle to bring together the body, people in the body of Christ. Not only can I do it, I love to do it. He's a foundational apostle of the church, and so are the rest of his yeah, international one, coalition of yeah, apostles. Yeah, I was in Zimbabwe when his prophetess, Cindy Jacobs, came and prophesied that Zimbabwe was going to be the garden spot of Africa and how there was going to be a revival and a blessing. Under Robert Mugabe, that country was devastated. Both yeah. the Mashana and the Matabili tribe were devastated. A wealthy country was impoverished. The diametric opposite of what Cindy Jacobs said happened. But then she's never called to account. She's one of Peter Wagner's stable yes, of losers that's right. of false prophetesses. I see this repeatedly. When Mike Bickle came to Great Britain with the late John Wimber and the Kansas City false prophets in August of 1990 and said the great revival was going to begin in Britain and fan out across Germany. Well, we've had more mosques built in England than churches since August or October of 1990 when they said the outpouring was going to happen. Additionally, Paul Kane turned out to be an alcoholic and a homosexual and Bob Jones a womanizer, a sexually immoral man. This was Mike Bickle's people and his own personal predictions. Another was Rick Joyner's book called, uh, I think it was called The Harvest. Yeah. He predicted communism was going to become nearly triumphant. Six months later, the Berlin Wall <laughs> came down. It was down, yeah. If you want to know what's going to happen, <laughs> here's how to know what's going to happen. Find out what Rick Joyner prophesies and figure on the diametric opposite. <laughs> it That's seems his track to, record. It That's seems his to be the documented, case. proven track record. Well, you know, these guys who claimed, I mean, Paul addressed this. He, these guys who claimed to be to be the, on the same level, equal with the apostles, are act, actually what the Bible defines as false, false apostles. apostles. That's right. And guess who they're, and they're masquerading. And guess who they're following in masquerading as false apostles? They're following their, their father, who is the enemy. That's exactly what Paul warned about in 2 Corinthians. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so given this, that information, what are we to expect then in the end times? Are we to expect a final outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Or does this, you know, I mean, exactly what, what, are, what are we to expect? What does the Bible say about that? First of all, the Bible speaks much more yeah. of a great end times falling away and apostasia than it yeah. does a great end times revival. Secondly, most of the prophecies concerning an outpouring of the Spirit, like in Zechariah 12, are focused on Israel and That's the Jews right, they're Israel. after God turns His grace back to His ancient people. Again, they completely well, distort the context. This is another problem. They're applying, they're willy-nilly applying everything in the Old Testament to the church because they actually are replacement theologists and they think that yes. the church has replaced Israel. But, you know, I, I've got news, I'm sorry for the Calvinists, but uh, 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no one deceive you, for it will not come unless an apostasy, which is a falling away, comes first. They don't like that word, falling away. And then also 1 Timothy 4.1, But the Spirit explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from yes. the faith. Yes. I, I hate to say, but there, there are people who will wander away and fall away from, from their faith. And I'm, I, I've got the emails to prove it. I've got people who have been absolutely destroyed by word of faith churches <laughs> in particular because they've been promised all kinds of stuff that isn't going to happen. They have a different, like you were talking about redefining terms. They have a different definition of faith, a different definition of tithing, all, all, all the kinds of things that come along with it. The bottom line, Sam, if there is a bottom line, is this. Just as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the second coming of Christ, the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist, which is controlled by Antichrist, we might say the spirit of Antichrist working through the spirit of the age is preparing the harlot church for the coming of the Antichrist. When we see these false prophets like Bill Johnson, like Rick Joyner, like Mike Bickle, operating and misguiding people who profess to be born again and the way to the extent they are, they have to understand something. We need to understand something. Yes. They're helping to set the stage for the Antichrist. They're setting the stage. If you cannot see to an obvious heretic 
like Benny Hinn, an obvious deceiver like Kenneth Copeland, an obvious false prophet like Rick Joyner or C. Peter Wagner. If you can't see through obvious deceivers, what is going to happen when real deception comes? Well, that, I, I often bring that up because, you know, the Bible talks about the, the false prophet with a big F coming and actually bringing fire down from heaven. Now, I think to myself, how many Christians so-called would follow a guy like that if he brings down real fire from heaven? I would say almost virtually every single person because they don't understand that the enemy can also do real signs and wonders. They're lying signs and wonders because they're not from God, but he can do amazing things. And uh, we've got to get ready for that as Christians to understand that there's a lot of stuff out there being peddled as real signs and wonders that is absolutely lying signs and wonders. One of those things I'm, I'm saying is slain in the spirit. And I had, I had a, a, a a uh, experience with this when I was right in the middle of Brownsville meetings and I saw the effects of this there was a deacon who was laying on the ground <laughs> and he's he's moaning and yell, yelling for help and vomiting <laughs> and he can't get up because having been slain in the spirit by these guys from Brownsville and I stood I stood over him and I'm, I'm thinking about the Bible I'm going this is this is demonism. This guy's demonized. So I called the guy over and I said, this guy is demonized. This, this is not how the Holy Spirit treats people. And this guy says, oh, no. Oh, no. The Holy Spirit's all over him. And I just thought to myself, you know what? When people get a different spirit, they start listening to that different right. spirit. And that spirit is, is acting like it's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's trying to get through to say, you know what? That person is demonized. He needs help. It is a fact that the Vineyard Movement particularly, what they had been calling demonic activity, five years later they were calling the Holy Spirit. Yeah, right. Five years earlier it was demonic. The same phenomena, five years later they were That's calling the That's what shocked me when I first saw your tape on, on that whole issue because, you know, uh, all of a sudden the whole thing changed. Let's understand something. Biblically slain in the Spirit, as when John was in the Spirit in the Lord's Day, and fellows that slain, it was a once in a lifetime life-changing experience. When these things happened in the ministry of people like John Wesley and Jonathan Edwards, it was unsaved people falling under the power of God, repenting of their sin and being born again. It wasn't Christians acting like drunken mongooses. Right. That was not what was happening. In the scripture, it was once in a lifetime. The young man who the devil was throwing, the demons were throwing you into the fire. He fell as if dead when the power of Jesus came on him and got up in his right mind. What you see happening today bears no resemblance to it. No. To begin with, they always fell forward. What we would call in Hebrew, hishtakbaya, or in Greek, proskuto. They always went forward. The only time people ever went backward was when they came to arrest Jesus. Yep. Well, if you really think God did it and God caused it, he must be angry at you because you fell the that, wrong way. That's, that's one thing that I brought up because they were bringing that up as a proof text. I'm going... But that's a judgment from God. What you're experiencing uh, yes. is a judgment from God. He's saying, you know, get away from this. But, you know, I just, I've never understood this because I really believe that the Holy Spirit works in an entirely different way than the, than, than the spirit, the, the Satan, the, the Antichrist spirit. Because the Holy Spirit works with the will of people. He doesn't force people unless it's under judgment. He doesn't force people to, to believe in him or anything. But the enemy, on the other hand, he loves to throw people down and get them all, you know. Yes. And, 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 and like all the, all the examples we have in Scripture of the demoniacs and stuff, that's the kind of stuff we're seeing in these churches. The fruit of the Spirit is secrete, self-control. Right. I've pointed this out many times. That's a big one. Another factor, though, and this is what's really most frightening. In Second Thessalonians, concerning the advent of Antichrist, the Lord himself will send a delusion That's right. upon them to make them believe what is false. The reason you see people getting sucked into things like Hillsong in Australia and sucked into things like um, Holy Trinity Brompton in London and, and, and people getting sucked into Bill Johnson's church, the Lord is giving these people over in judgment because they reject the truth. Well, what yeah. does it say? Because they do not love a knowledge of the truth. They, Therefore, they the Lord will send a deception. 
these people are in grave danger. That's a scary of, thing. Of coming under a spirit of error. It's a scary thing when God switches over from grace to say, all right, if that's the way you're going to act, I'm going to let you just go on your way. You have and a the spirit same of thing, error. Same thing happened back in Babel. You know, yes. he gave them over because they decided to create this false religion. Yes. You know, right after the, the great flood. And uh, so it says, you know, Romans 1 is especially about how he gave them over to all these things. How he put a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's that's, prophets. That's right. You wanna, Same you thing. You want to reject the truth? You don't want to believe the truth? I'll make you believe yeah. a lie. I'll make you believe false prophets. And, you know, a spirit yeah. of error. They come under judgment. My plea to young people listening to Hillsong, or my plea to young people who were caught up in Bill Johnson's church, or following Mike Bickle, in the name of God, get out of that insane asylum. Run away. Run away. Avoid it like the plague. Yep. So how did you get involved in this, in the movement that you were involved in? I got saved in the early 70s out of the Lutheran Church and went looking for a church I did find for several years, watched TBN, so grateful to be saved uh, out of a uh, head knowledge of the Lord, um, raised in a Lutheran home uh, in a church I thought I was saved I wasn't when I got saved my life completely changed um, almost ruined my marriage but my life completely changed and I got into the body of Christ glad to be saved and um, looking for uh, the the early charismatic movement was very powerful and the baptism and Holy Spirit touched everybody including me and it went from that to signs and wonders, and I finally went to a few wicked and perverse conferences, that's what Jesus called them, when they're looking for a sign and a wonder. And, um, and it just kind of grew from there, from the, um, from the television. 
and um, it it finally got boring, and I just I, I it didn't make sense. And I was listening to this person and that person and going to this conference and that conference, and I just drew back. And I was watching Copeland and all the rest of them, and I just said to myself, is he never going to teach on anything but the blessing, the blessing, the blessing? And a friend of mine uh, handed me a quarterly from Moriel, the one that Jacob wrote that uh, was titled uh, Jehu, God's Assassin, and it just ripped right through me. I knew it was truth. And I called the phone book, the phone number that was on the quarterly, talked to David Lister. And I had to have some more. I had to have CDs. I had to have something to learn some more about this. And um, David Lister talked to me for 20 minutes or almost half an hour, asked me if I knew what Midrash was. Of course, I didn't. And he said, oh, we're going to have, uh, Jacob's going to be in Southern California here and I said, really? And he said, yeah, in divorce. I said, divorce? Nobody's ever in divorce. And so Jacob was due to speak out here in a couple months, and I went to hear him. And at that point, Jacob said, um, if you're looking for a good church, I recommend this one. And it was from then on that I began to learn the real word and to find out that there was so much life in the word itself. I had listened to people teach short portions of scripture, which sounded really fine. And I just realized it was getting duller and duller and um, it was a mess. And I was really without a church until I found one that, that taught. And then I got into Danny Isom's um, Bible study, and I it was incredible. So, what would you, what would you advise people to do who are caught up in that uh, those TV preachers and whatever, uh, and how can they, how can they get out of that and move? move well, ahead? what I did was just pick up the Bible and read it, and I read and I read and I read, and once I got through the repenting, and it took a while to repent. And um, when, when you get a new truth that you realize is, is uh, contrasting to a lie that you've had in, it, it's almost like a little piece of, of darkness just leaves. And every time it leaves, you repent again. And it's just a series of repentance, repentance, repentance. Uh, to this day, I'm still repenting. Oh, Lord. Uh, when I used to believe that or used to believe this and, and uh, I found out that just reading the word was enough. It didn't matter what in it I read and I realized very quickly that the sermons that I was listening to took a few verses which found it sounded wonderful, sounded great. Yeah, oh, we've got all this power and we are seated with him in heavenly places and and he wants us blessed, and he wants us wealthy, and he wants, oh, gosh, oh, I'm so, I still repent of it. It just hurts. So, do you think, <clears throat> you, you, do you really, do you think that you had to basically have your whole sort of Christian worldview <laughs> rearranged? Yes, yes. It had gone so deep, and it, it appeals to the flesh so much that, uh, I realize uh, I had nothing on the Is Israelites at the foot of the mountain. I, I mean, uh, when Moses went for the commandments, uh, we all have our own golden calves, and it just was disgusting. It's disgusting, and it, it's so good to be free, and uh, just to read the word, to read it in context. Danny taught us to read inductively, and take the whole passage and understand where it came from and what it's saying. Well, it makes a big difference to have the Bible taught verse by verse, which I was so glad to see is going on in this church. And because otherwise, you're just you're hunting and pecking and pulling out things you like, but and making up your own doctrine from them instead of having the Bible right. correct you. 
I had one more major issue that in the Lutheran Church, obviously it had an effect, uh, uh, they don't teach eschatology at all. So when I got saved, everything was premill premillennial rapture, da da da, and I wasn't a bit sure about the rapture. So I laid it on a table. I just set it aside, and essentially thought mm, the rapture sounds good, but it's just too good to be true. I really didn't. Yeah, I just didn't believe it too much. I didn't pay too much attention to it. When I came here, Pastor Marco was teaching on Revelation. And I thought, okay, I'm going to go here as long as he's teaching Revelation. That's why I'm here. I've got to learn about Revelation because I knew I never learned about it. And I know it's true, but I don't know. I don't understand it. And one day in church, I burst into tears because I got a revelation from the Holy Spirit. And it was real, real, real. Poor Marco came down from the platform. He thought it, he'd done something wrong and something was wrong with me. I said, no, something's right. But by the Holy Spirit, I got a revelation one Sunday. So I stayed here on, on, until he was through with revelation, which was a long time. It was a few years. And then I thought I was supposed to leave, but I wasn't. <laughs> I was due to stay here. So I just stayed on. And it's wonderful. It's great to come to a church that, that you're free. It, you know you're not going to have to fight the demons of mm, bad teaching. Sometimes when churches are that bad, you are worse when you come home than when you went. You put up with all the doubt and unbelief. Okay, so um, what kind of a movement were you involved with and when did you see that you kind of needed to get out of it and, and get involved in a, a biblical church or whatever? <laughs> well, I had a good start. Uh, I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist, and uh, so I had a lot of teaching that was false right from the beginning, being in a, in a cult like that. And uh, then I left the church, and years later I came back back into a Seventh-day Adventist church. But this was different. This was a, a, a very, very liberal, open Seventh-day Adventist church, unlike any other in this area. And uh, they had a lot of teaching that was new to me, and I was hungry to learn um, more about the Lord. I wanted to, to be uh, serve Him. And so... Um, there was the Alpha course that was given. I went to Cleansing Stream several times <clears throat> to um, be cleansed. Uh, and um, let's see, we had uh, Rick Warren come as one of our speakers. So I went through the whole gamut of all these people. But the thing that brought me out of that church was that a dear friend that went had been studying about Ellen G. White. And she did a, a, a long study that took us two years on uh, the shadow and substance. And we did a, a, a comparison of what Ellen G. White teaches, why we did this, and why we shouldn't, what the word said. And that brought me out. It was heartbreaking because I, I had to leave all the people that I've known since I was a child, including my family. Um, from there, we thought, okay, we've arrived. My husband had become a Christian, had been baptized in the church, and now we were worshiping together. We went into a Sunday-keeping church, and I thought, wow, here we are, finally where the Lord wants us. But through that, we learned a lot about the signs and wonders. Uh, we did conferences right there in our church. We had Todd Bentley come, and we had John Paul uh, Jones and, oh, Jackson, and just various. We went to The Rock in Pasadena, Che On, and saw uh, Heidi Baker. And, uh, you know, we've seen them all. And um, <laughs> we got to the point where we got just really tired of, they were all, everything was about money. You know, this conference, 200, that conference. And people were running, all of our friends <clears throat> were running to go to these conferences. Oh, are you going to go this? Are you going to go that? And so we began to pull away, and, and actually, I, I really truly believe it was the work of the Lord to pull us out of this. We got the experience of what was happening. We saw, but um, we had a, a, an issue with our pastor. 
of some things that he was doing that were that were not right. They were so obvious. And we actually lost our church. We were evicted, a church being evicted out of its own <laughs> building. And so this was heartbreaking to us, and we left the church. We thought, we're not going back anymore. You know, we, we, everywhere we go, we tried visiting churches, and all they talked about is the prophetic, and you got to get up and speak the prophetic. All this stuff was just everywhere. Well, we began a ministry out in a park. No walls. Uh, there was nothing there except the grass and the trees, and we began ministering to children. This grew into ministering for parents and adults, too, and we're still there today. But what truly changed us completely and brought us back into the Lord is we started a Bible study. We were invited to somebody's house, and we were invited, and Jacob Prosh was there. <laughs> He's been mighty instrumental in our lives, and so we went to hear him. And I had been looking for a Bible study, but all the Bible studies were on the languages of love or a Father Lawrence or, you know, these are the kinds of things we kept falling into. And so I wanted to hear the word of God. I wanted to know it. I wanted to understand it. And so uh, we came and then we were invited to continue coming to the Bible study weekly, which Danny Isom was giving. And we began to really understand and it just changed our lives. It's, it's still changing our lives. It's a continual thing. Uh, I like what my friend uh, Rusty said about repenting. It's a continuous repentance. You're reading something and it just hits you and you say, that's me. You know, I need to change this. And these are areas that God is showing us. So I, I really truly believe it was divine intervention that the Lord had a use for us elsewhere and it wasn't going to be in the church there um and so we we started coming here to divorce actually danny said you guys aren't going to church you need to get connected in fellowship and we began to come here to divorce and um that's pretty much and you know you asked that i think uh tim mentioned that we were supposed to explain why or what we would say to our friends I have many, many, many friends, and I see them on Facebook, and I see they're quoting Joel Olstein, Rick Warren, and, and I'm just, it breaks my heart every time I see that, and I just continually pray for them, that they will come to truth, and the only place they're going to get truth is through the Word of God. Mm -hmm. They have to break that Bible open that's sitting on the shelf with dust on it. They have to open it up and study it, not read it. I've read the Bible many, many times. They have to study it word for word, you know, um, and, and really get to have an understanding. Uh, I liked when, when um, Jacob was teaching on Midrash. Wow, that was eye-opening. And to have an understanding why these things were said, who they were being said to, why they were being said, and that they're relevant to us today. All these things are relevant to us today. And if I could say one thing to my friends is get back into God's word. Begin to study it. Put aside all those books. I took all my books, Rick Joyner and Wagner, all these. I took them and burned them. I would not give them away. I didn't want anybody else to have them. And I burned them and will not have them. What just cleared my shelves off because I love to read. I had all these books on my shelf that I had been reading. And it's misleading. It's not the word of God. He has everything we need. In his word, he's given it to us. It's a, the most beautiful gift we could have. And uh, that's that's what I would say to my dear friends, and I pray for them all the time. You know, one thing that, that Carol had left out, though, when we started going to the conferences with uh, with Todd Bentley and, and, and Bill Johnson and, and these guys, we were seeing so much that they spent more time on a sermon of why you need to give money than they did on anything else. And I and they're they're preaching on gold dust in your hands and diamonds falling and look it's coming. Well, why are they preaching on money if they got all this gold dust laying there? They can just ought to be able to wipe that off and go down to the <laughs> to the market and sell it. I remember at one Todd Bentley conference, they were getting ready to take up offering after a forty five minute sermon on if you give two hundred, you're gonna get two thousand back. And it had the people all worked up. I, I saw one of his own people go up and throw a wad of money on stage. Now, nobody else in the audience probably knew this, 
But then people started running up on stage and throwing money down. And it had to be tens of thousands of dollars by the time it was through. And Todd Bentley sitting there saying how important he is that when he goes, people clamor to carry his luggage. They take him to the best hotels. They take him to the best restaurants. And, and I'm thinking, you know, and Bill Johnson is saying, if you've got a, a, an ailment like a, a, a knee out, I just reach up into the throne room and there's a whole warehouse up there of body parts and I pull it down and put it on them. I mean, the, uh, the, so we started seeing real fast, something's not right here. So these people aren't, but people were in a frenzy. It was like a rock concert. We saw people, they would go in and start laughing and lay hands on somebody. That person would fall down and then that person would start laughing and get back up. Well, they had, they had somebody now. Every time that person would get up, they would lay hands on them and laugh and that person would fall back down. It was, it was like a clown outfit going on there. And you're thinking, yeah, this ain't right. But the money part was what I started noticing. Give me that 200 and you're going to have $2,000 next week. Give me that gold watch you got there and you're going to get diamonds around your neck. And then feathers falling. Whoa, whoa, whoa. God has signs and wonders, but he doesn't have it for your glory. <laughs> anyway, I think anyway. the greatest signs and wonders we've seen is people repenting and yeah. people turning to the Lord. Amen. And, and even out of our ministry, having people yeah. baptize and come to the Amen. Lord. Those are the greatest miracles and those are the ones we want to see. But we still have so many friends that are in that. Yeah, and you just cool. can't tell them they're going to have to learn it themselves and by praying and and they don't they don't read the word they think they do but they read what they want to hear